my research and reading more about you know, the work that you do, I had a question on my mind. And knowing that you were working at Microsoft, it was a really good job, it sounds like. And you, know, you could have maybe stayed in the US and seen the issues we're having here in Africa and decided to maybe just do some philanthropy work or be a mentor or something else, be a volunteer, a board member of another organization. Why did you feel the need? Because I know you mentioned you, know, you had a son and you were thinking of what the future of Africa would be like. Why did you feel the need to start something? Why, what was that driving force? Because we have a lot of youth here who are thinking, should I start something? Should I not? Should I join someone? Or should I just, you know, just pray for the nation and hope things get well? What was that driving force that made you start at Chester University? Well, um, so let me say first that um, I had this idea in my head that in much the same way that Asia had the Asian tigers, you know, Singapore, South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Japan, um, in the 50s, 60s, through the 80s, they really changed the world. Um, that we needed to have a similar phenomenon in Africa. And so, so this was the thing that I felt it, it's so important for future generations. And once you have a few countries that really take off, the rest of the continent will take off as well. And the world would change for all people of African descent, regardless of where they live. Um, now, you're right that I could, have, I could have stayed at Microsoft, I could have stayed at high tech, and, and, and that was one possibility. Um, I, I considered, look, just stay where you are, um, continue to do well financially, and one day donate to somebody to go <laughs> deal, with the, deal with the problem. But, but I, I worried a little bit. Eventually, the reason I left was that I worried that I might regret not having taken that step. That I felt that I was in a position to make a contribution. And there was a responsibility in a way that people like me who have had a lot of opportunities should at least try. So that's really what drove me to, to leave. So that weight of responsibility that you had been given a lot, you'd had opportunities, and so why not give back in that way? That's okay. correct. So then why then the education sector? Why not you know, start a tech hub and you know, encourage young people in tech. Why did you specifically choose education? I, well, I wanted to, I initially wanted to start a software company, and, uh, but, but the reason I, I decided not to do that was that I discovered that there were, you know, the computer science programs in Ghana were not using computers. They were, students were learning coding on paper. And so the the human capital was not being developed at the, at the level that it needed to be for, for me to be successful if I tried that. Uh, and ultimately, I decided to engage with education and higher education in particular because I felt that through higher education, I could contribute towards changing the future leadership of, of a society. And if I could change a future leadership, then that would be a sea change in, in the country. All right, thank you very much. Now, in starting Ashesi University, what were some challenges you faced? We have um, budding social entrepreneurs here. We have people who already have established their own social enterprises. What were some challenges that you faced, and how did you overcome them? There are a lot of challenges. I'll, I'll mention maybe two or three that are especially important. Um, the first is funding, OK? Um, and, and I, I start with funding uh, because I, I felt um, if you have funding, you can find good people to join your team, okay? So for me, it was really important to understand where would the funding come from. I was fortunate to be at Microsoft, so I had certain means of my own that I could contribute, and I had friends around me. I had a network that could contribute. And so I could see myself starting a venture that, was, that is quite capital intensive. Um, for, 
for young social entrepreneurs going out, I think that when you, you think about the question of funding, you should be very honest with yourself. If you don't have a lot of funding, you should try to have uh, a project that is not initially capital intensive. Something that you can start with a little bit of money and grow from there. Um, and, and, you know, projects that are sort of service related rather than producing a product um, come to mind as some, you know, that are not as capital intensive. The second problem was building a team, right? You, you can only be as successful as the strength of the team that you have. And it's really important to find the right people in your team, the people who share your values, people who are hardworking, who are committed, and who have some domain expertise that you need, and people who complement you. In my case, I'm not an academic. I don't, you know, um, I don't have a, a PhD. My doctorate is an, is on, is an honorary doctorate. Um, and so I needed to find people who had domain expertise in education to join me on my project. Uh, and then the third challenge was, uh, to be honest, uh, you know, I grew up in Ghana, but I left Ghana after my first year of national service to go to college in the US. So I hadn't really had experience working in Ghana. My experience was being a, a student. And, you know, coming back and working in Ghana was challenging. There were difficulties there that um, I didn't have to deal with when I was in Seattle. Um, there were, you know, the, the bureaucratic, let me say the regulatory system was very difficult and not very fast moving. And I was coming out of an environment where everything moved really, really fast, right? In high tech in the US, you know, everything is moving so fast and I was sort of used to that pace and I get to Ghana and it was different. And the, the way to overcome that for me was simply to say, I'm not going to rage against the system. Um, when you're an entrepreneur, you don't always have the luxury of changing the system overnight. In fact, you never have the luxury of changing the system overnight. The system change that you seek will take time. So for a period, you're, you're having to operate within the system and you have to, you have to sort of put your crea creative energies around how do you operate within the system even as you're trying to change it in the long term. And this is very important. Thank you very much. I like that, um, that you brought in that thought about working with the system. As young people, I'm sure they can identify with this. You want to change things. You wake up with a passion. You're you know, passionate about something. You want to see things changing so quickly. But then you get discouraged. You hit that barrier when it looks like, but I just want to help. And there are so many systems working against me. I like how you mentioned we don't have to rage against the system. We need to work with it and see how we can start to change it. Because sometimes we have to even be on the inside, be trusted, be known, before right. you can start to try to propose some of those changes right. that we do want I mean, to. The one caveat I would add is that there are certain things that we refuse to work with the system on. And those are things that have to do with ethics, integrity, corruption. Mm -hmm. For me, the analogy that I use is that it's, it's like you're a tree. Right? A tree has three, three or four uh, main components. There's a, the, the root system, there's a trunk, and the branches, and then there are leaves, right? Your values, what you stand for, are like the root of the tree. If there's a storm and the root moves, then you know that the organism is about to die. It's about to fall. But in a storm, a tree can lose its leaves. The branches can sway and bend. Even the trunk can move a little bit. And so the thing that you have to try to understand is, you know, your values have to be rock solid. You have to be very clear about 
what it is that doesn't move and what is it that can move and what is that must move for your organization to survive. Thank you very much. I think that's very well taken. Values are very important and knowing what you stand for, eventually people start to know that that is what you stand for and hopefully they don't try to propose some unethical things to you. Right. right. So um, the MC mentioned the meaning of Ashesi, which is um, beginning in Fanti. Why that name Ashesi? Why did you, and how does it tie into the vision of Ashesi University? Right. So when I, I, finally, I decided to leave Microsoft, in order to um, manage my fear, I went to business school because I figured I'd go learn. This the analogy I gave you about you have to go read about the mountain, right, before you try to climb it. I decided to go to business school, and while I was at business school in, you know, uh, in the Bay Area, um, I had a few requests for me to return to high tech. You know, I, I, the folks at Microsoft asked me like two or three times if I would come back and there were some other companies in the Bay Area that uh, approached me. And to be honest, I was tempted. Uh, I was worried. And then one day, I read the, the words of Goethe, um, German playwright. And it said, whatever you can do or dream you can, begin it. Boldness has genius power and magic in it. Begin it now. So I typed those words up, and I put them on my mirror. So I'd see them every morning. And uh, one day, I got called and, uh, by a company that wanted me to pursue a job there, and I said, no, I'm, really going, I, I'm planning to go start this university in Ghana. And that day, that moment, I said, wow, I'm really committed. This is the beginning. So I suggested to my co-founder, we should call this university the beginning in an African language. And she liked it because she also felt that it was, it's a name that would remind future managers that they should treat every day, every year as a new beginning. And she also felt that this institution would in fact represent a new beginning for the students who come there. So that's how we chose the name. Okay, that's very inspiring. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure that the audience has questions. Do we have anyone who has a question for Dr. Iwa? Any questions before I go on? Okay, so we have a question. I'll have one of my colleagues um, get the question and then we'll continue the conversation. So you've worked with a number of young people. I sit here as a young person who is passionate about social transformation, as well as someone who works in an organization where we are equipping young people to build their passion for social change. But what are some challenges that some of your young people have faced? You know, they come to Ashesi, there's this campus where there's, you know, that culture of ethics and values and respect and respect for diversity and inclusion. And then they go out into the world, into their different countries. What are some of the challenges that your alumni have mentioned that they have faced as young people in the social space? Well, Many of them have faced some of the same challenges that I talked about. You know, how do you find funding? Um, and how do you sort of navigate the system? Uh, they've faced challenges around uh, corruption, where there are people that are demanding bribes in order to get anything done, and, and all of that. Um, the way we've approached that uh, to help our students cope when they graduate is that we actually simulate some of these situations um, as part of the curriculum. Um, and the idea is that when you, if, you're, if you're training a pilot, you, they go in a flight simulator, and because they've practiced, when they actually confront the real problem, they know how to navigate. And so we have a course called Giving Voice to Values where we throw all these cases at them and then they have to role act how they will deal with those cases. And often when they get out into the real world, they find that that is very helpful for them to navigate. With the issues around funding um, and building a team, they're, they're employing different strategies. I know of a few, some of our alumni who have even though they've, they have a project that they want to do themselves, they've gone and worked somewhere else for a while, 
and then they start the project as a, something that they do on the weekends. And then as they're building their network and building their capital, they then eventually switch full time to, to the project. Um, and then the other is you know, just family and friends initially to get started, you, you show results. And as you show results and build credibility, you get more, you get more funding. So there's just this very tricky period where you have to, you have to somehow execute on a shoestring and so such excellent results that uh, the, the people who have the funds to give you trust you to give you the funds to do the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. I like the simulating the situations for them, putting them in that scenario, making them um, understand what is waiting for them out there, um, so right. to speak, and then preparing them for it. So from your talks, I gather a lot about preparation, 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 right. preparing your mind, preparing the students, preparing people who are working with you. Um, so here we have different people here. We have the private sector represented here. Um, our sponsors, Union Bank. We have other private sector players here. We have development partners. We have the young people. We have public sector officials. Um, how can we collaborate more to support young people to be able to grow their passion for social transformation? I think that um, one of the most important things that we all need to do is to have more confidence in young people and, and, to, and to give them a chance. Uh, when you're young in Silicon Valley and you go to a funder, they don't hold that against you. In fact, they, they sort of celebrate the youth. Um, I know when I started at Microsoft, I was in my 20s. And you know, I was working on projects with people from IBM who were much older than I was and who took me very seriously. Uh, and then when I returned to Ghana to work and I was you know, 35 years old, Everybody thought, thought I was a kid, and they didn't take me as seriously. Uh, and I think we need to change that, because one of, the, one of the advantages of youth is you don't know what you can't do. And because you don't know what you can't do, you're more likely to actually do it. And, and they deserve that sort of uh, vote of confidence to get started. And like all things, you can start small, and show and have them prove themselves before you go in uh, bigger. But get, taking that first step is really important. Thank you very much. So to the older people here, believe in us young people, we, <laughs> we may make mistakes, right? We may not have seen far, as far as you have, but we do have ideas. And with people you know, like you around us, we are watching you, we are learning from you. I think having faith in us would be helpful. So we have two questions here. One question is from um, someone I think who works with an education-focused organization as well. And the question is, how did you deal with the government barriers and bureaucratic issues when you were starting at Chelsea University? Well, with um, you know, the government barriers and bureauc bureaucracy, my first strategy was actually to assume that people mean well. Uh, even the person who is putting a roadblock in your way, if you're engaging that person in as positive a manner as possible with the assumption that, well, this person is trying to make sure that I do a good job, um, then it, it sort of changes the tone of the conversation a little bit. So that, that was the first thing. The second thing was that I so reminded myself that change doesn't come easily. And if you want to, if you, to transform a country requires a struggle. It's, it's, not, it's not going to be easy. If you, if you say you're gonna climb Mount Everest, 
it's going to be difficult. It's going to be painful sometimes. And you, you sort of have to go, th you have to get in there with that mindset. What people don't realize, you know, people talk about my story at Microsoft and say, well, it's such a great, well, that was, that had its own difficulties as well. I mean, I would wake up in the morning, go to work, breakfast at work, lunch at work, dinner at work, go home, crash, <laughs> sleep, get up, repeat. And it was, it was a ton of work. I used to say that the day I have to work more than 16 hours a day, my boss has to hire another person. And I told him that. <laughs> but it meant that there were times of the year when I was working up to 16 hours a day. Um, but if you say you're gonna build software to change the world, it's going to be a struggle. If you're gonna build an, an organization to change Nigeria, it's going to be a struggle. And if you have that mindset that, oh, this is a struggle that was going to come, how do I deal with it? Then you, you deal with it as a problem to be solved and you get through it. Thank you very much. So have a mindset, to the person who asked the question and to everyone, have a mindset that the person just wants to help or make sure that you do the work better. And just have a mindset that, yes, it's going to be challenging, but I'm going to do the work that I have to do. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. What final words of wisdom would you share with us young people on how we can better you know, ignite our passion for social transformation? I think that um, you know, when I look at you know, some of the changes going on, the demographic growth in Africa, and um, you know, even today on the continent, you know, and I grew up in Ghana. There, in my lifetime, there has never been a better time to be living in Africa than today. When I was growing up, there were coups all the time, military governments, a lot of disruption. And those days are past in most countries on the continent. And so there's been a lot of progress made. There's still a lot of work to be done, but I think that if we do that work well, Africa is where the action is going to be in the world economy if we do our work right. And so we need to proceed with that, with that sort of mindset and that vision that, you know, the Chinese, the Europeans, the Americans, are all going to want to do business in, in Africa. And it is, it is a real opportunity for us. And if we move forward with that mindset that we're going to make this the place where most of the world's wealth is going to be created, or a significant amount of the world's wealth is going to be created in the next 30 to 50 years, um, then we execute differently and we're able to actually take advantage of that opportunity. Thank you so much. So Africa is where the action is right now. And so we are blessed, I think, to be Africans and to be here at this time. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your time. We appreciate your words of wisdom and um, all that you've shared here today. It's a Thank pleasure. you so much. It's a pleasure. Thank you.